Today I'm talking with Nate Wright, freelance author for Paizo. He works on the Mwangi Expanse and the Anadi in particular, which I love. He's also done Pathfinder Society scenario with the Helm's Hide and Echoes of Desperation. And the Starfinder Society Dreaming of the Future, among other things. He also has a blog for his ideas, and they're very well made, very mechanically stable. The blog is nodirectionpodcast.com, and his segment is Eldritch Excursion. In this segment, we talk about how to make weird characters and a few examples of them. It's quite fun. Enjoy. Um, so you were going to tell me about your favorite character. Yeah, I won't take up too much time since uh, there are a few things as shamelessly indulgent as let me tell you about my character, but the short... No, part, people uh, love that. Do it. Really? Well, so um, she's one of the characters that is a perfect fusion of mechanics and flavor in my eyes. So Dr. Mayosa, she is a, an alchemist, first edition, human question mark so her backstory is that she was a uh, born with a weird deformity left by her parents but picked up by the cult of lamash too that very much nurtured this difference within her she even found a talented uh, alchemical surgeon within there that taught her everything he knew and one day when the, her deformity which was just a giant painful cyst on her back they finally opened it up, and it turned out she had been growing a tentacle just under her skin, and it finally blossomed. And that's the point where she truly found herself. It blossomed like a beautiful rose. <laughs> sort of. More like a black, inky vine, but yes. <laughs> so, at that point, she began to master and practice the art of surgery, and she realized that her body was incomplete and it wouldn't grow everything it needed. So she needed to find it and thus began her quest, her endless need, her addiction. Find monsters, hunt them, remove the organs, put them in her body. Mechanically, that's cool. Mechanically, she is a fairly traditional um, strength-based, of course, mutagen-focused uh, alchemist. Um, every discovery she takes is some sort of overt physical mutation or ability. And every feat she takes is extra discovery. Save for power attack and iron will, because why would you play a frontliner without power attack and iron will? That's silly. <laughs> so, um, she near the end of her career, she had uh, bug wings, the tentacle, uh, layers of claws and teeth that came out when she drank her mutagen. Um, she had self-mummified, so she was probably pale in complexion a bit. Um, Self-mummification. Oh. Yeah, there's a there's a mid there's kind of a late slash mid game discovery where if you picked at least one organ rearrangement for crit reduction, which of course she had one of those, um, you could also mummify, which uh, rules wise granted you immunity to non lethal damage and cold. Which is funny because of a whole lot of things like hunger and lack of sleep deal non-lethal damage, which yeah. I assume she'd still not enjoy it, but, you know, she could just keep going. She's a monstrous um, machine. Oh, yeah. Um, I took max ranks in disguise because even though my charisma was absolute ass, that's how I justified being able to go out in public. That makes sense. Enough ranks to put on a heavy co coat, a uh, scarf, white broomed hat. Uh, oh, and even better, she, uh, you know, the, the, the parasitic twin, she got yeah. that where it just comes out of your chest, which I was expecting I, I, that from her back. Uh, no, it comes out of her chest and she's got the spare arms. Uh, and the archetype where your mutagen becomes its own personality. Yeah. Uh, she went a bit too overboard and then her brain sort of split now. And, uh. The way I flavor it is, so that parasitic twin is kind of pale and white and bulbous, <laughs> and it has asymmetrical eyes. When the mutagen personality takes over, when Weaver takes over, they switch places. So now it's this large, 
bulbous headed thing with like multiple eyes, but they're all on one side of its head and it's got these long gangly fingers. And then Meosa's just glassy eyed protruding from its torso, assisting it from time to time. Oh, And weird. uh, yeah, and have you ever played StarCraft 2? I think so. The Zerg campaign? Yeah. Abathur. The the guy who creates all your Zerg, the the engineer, quote unquote. Don't remember, I'm sorry. Oh, that's all right, because I basically just filed the numbers off and made that it. He just kind of talked about and since the mutagen forms a different alignment, so Dr. Meosa, chaotic neutral. One of those characters where I like to say, oh, they're neutral for legal purposes. <laughs> but Yeah, uh that makes sense. yeah. I am glad for that reason that alignment isn't uh, existent anymore in Pathfinder 2 because you just have an excuse to do whatever weird crap you want to now. Well, see, I I think we didn't go hard enough to really get the best out of it, but the sanctified mechanic essentially does what I would have wanted out of it anyways. The fact that you're not just good, quote-unquote, the fact that you're kind of touched in the head by the gods and, like, the neutrality of the material planes being replaced by this alien essence just a bit. I, one of my articles went over the idea of good and evil as these foreign concepts that are being artificially like imposed upon reality. Like like if you're a if you're a bastard that steals and cheats and even murders, you're still neutral because you're a human capable of creative thought. But like a demon is physically composed of evil. It, Yeah. the concept of charity is as frightening to a devil as an elder god is to a human. They don't understand it. It's the antithesis of their being, and it terrifies them. That That was, that's the way I perceive it. no, I get that. That was like how uh, Dungeons and Dragons made the history of the abyss evolve. The hmm. reason that succubi, um, there, the, the reason that there was a queen of the succubi, is because the demons that were spawned from the far realm into the extruded material of the abyss, up until that point, were simply violent, aggressive, abusive. dominating they didn't have a normal human's physical drives or biology of course so that when a succubus was randomly created by the abyss they were powerless against her essence of lust because they didn't recognize it they didn't understand how to deal with it so that's how there became a succubus queen because essentially they had no defense Hmm. Nice. I I kind of I like that idea. Yeah, it's pretty good. I I like it when the succubus gets cool lore and things. They also did that in Pathfinder with the Redeemer Queen. care to share because i don't know this Oh, that's some yeah. Um. So Nauticula, Nauticula. She is the. Earlier in the lore, she's essentially the demon lord goddess of succubuses, succubies, is, y you know. And, uh, you know, she had some pretty spicy lore, edgy stuff. And then later in the lore, and you actually see this in Wrath of the Righteous, the uh, spoilers, I guess, but she can eventually become redeemed and become the Redeemer Queen. And now she's like a chaotic, good goddess of like forgiveness art passion interesting who can still absolutely wreck you but she essentially gave up the evil ways yeah so now she's a deity option and it's pretty cool i like fascinating explorations into psychology and spiritualism mm -hmm. yeah and uh alignment definitely didn't do enough of that most people say it's got to go i say it dropped the ball In a way, we failed alignment <laughs> by, by not leaning into it hard enough. I agree, but I think it was also misunderstood and it could have been crafted differently from the beginning. Yeah, yeah. Because Gygax wanted to have alignment that was based solely on religion and politics, not actual spiritual belief. Oh, I'm sure that would have went over great. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how the first edition was constructed. It wasn't about what someone's moral leanings were. It was what they are affiliated with in society. Mm. You know, funny enough, in a roundabout way, that could work in something like, I have a limited understanding of 5e lore, but like the Curse of Strahd, apparently there are realms that are like, 
custom made super prisons yeah. for particular beings where their will is made manifest, but they're trapped in it. So yeah. the idea where alignment works that way because it's part of the elaborate mechanism that keeps some unstoppably powerful thing trapped inside of it, like a prison of its own mind, but you're in yeah. it too. But yeah, definitely the exception, not the norm. I think that's why I was fascinated with the Ravenloft books and the, what do they call them? The spirits of the mists, the, oh, the, the dark powers of the mists of Ravenloft. Mm. And that they were somehow like, it came out through the lore of a multitude of books and game books that the dark powers were evil, but they're siphoning off of, they're siphoning power and energy off of the evil of these evildoers doing more evil because they're restricted from doing anything else. So huh. the bad people that did bad things, the worst things that they did, they got more confined, more punished, but also more power to encourage them to do more evil shit. Huh, kind of a... That that reminds me of a... I had this lore that I was going to write for a old campaign that didn't get anywhere. The, the twist was going to be that the realm of hell existed and it was the engine that helped maintain reality. Souls had to go there and suffer because it was part of the process. Uh, and it was going to be, it wasn't just going to be like fire and brimstone. It was going to be this kind of surreal morphic nightmare realm where like souls lived out the worst things and how they died. And, uh, Okay, bit of a stretch. Have you ever seen the Madness Combat series? No, we seem to have completely opposite exposure. To... One of these days I'm going to hang out, we're going to do a watch party, and I'm just going to... You can think of a, a list of things, too. But it it's it's this old school thing from, like, the mid-2000s. Like, a, basically early internet John Woo fan animations, where there's this guy named Hank, and he kills a bunch of guys, and he does it in cool ways. And as the time went on, the animations got more elaborate, and it got this weird, creepy lore. And there's this afterlife, but it's like, it's like the normal realm, but kind of red and a bit more desolate. And there are still buildings and goons that exist in there, and sometimes the characters get sent down there, and it's just... Sometimes the stone will rip open and like a chain will come out and just pull you in because your soul's in hell, you're embedded in hell, so it can just move you around or do things to you. It it just has this weird feel of like surreal hyperviolence that I kind of wanted to channel in my setting. Sounds like um Hellraiser uh, uh Cenobites. Especially since the machine was falling apart and the PCs needed to fix it. <laughs> oh, that's fascinating. Because you have to uh, go save hell. You that's have to cool. say you have to fix hell. And also you have to uh save an alternate world. Uh it involves an infinite time loop, a portal, the Tarask, and a Eldritch creature. Don't worry about it. <laughs> you seem to do well heavily on the Eldritch, like I think that you have, I don't know if you've had a lot of exposure to the Cthulhu mythos, but it seems like you have a lot of ideas along the same path as um, cosmic horror. It's kind of funny. I've absorbed a ton of it through like osmosis. I haven't actually delved deep into a lot of these. One of my favorite things to say is, oh, the alien movies. Yeah, I saw Alien Resurrection. <laughs> Collective known by the majority of fans, is the objectively worst one. Oh, okay. It's like, it, it's not the classic one, it's not the cool two, it's not the controversial three, it's just this one that they made because it was a marketable franchise and they had some of the actors on tap. It sounds like I watched Hellraiser 3, Hell on Earth. Mm. It was absolutely the opposite of the intention of the Hellbound Heart, the, the book that the series came from and the first two movies hmm. but yeah i guess i just have a need to put weird twists on things like my favorite kind of characters to play as are the ones that do the right thing for the wrong reason like uh dr meosa yeah she hunts monsters all the time for their precious organs <laughs> she was so excited when she got to fight a troll for the first time that the next upgrade I purchased for her with feats was uh, the one where you have temporary regeneration because she had an epidermal underlay of troll flesh. That's the way I flavored that. I like that. That's cool. 
Mm. One of these days I should just, even though I don't play her anymore, I should commission art. I wanted to play her in 2E, but like, no, no. The 2E Alchemist, for all of its benefits, is a different class. It plays very differently. I hated it at first, but I leaned into it once I found the proper motivation. I, I stopped trying to be a spotlight hogger and said, no, my alchemist is the boss and the party is the help. She prepares her potions. She hands them out and they get the work done. Well, she occasionally contributes to the poisons. It's the CEO mindset. <laughs> Get, turn that mindset into a grind set and you're good to go. That totally does work for an alchemist. Mm. I've only heard one other person say something similar, so I don't think it's common. <laughs> yeah, actually, um, I'll, I'll tell you the secret to one of my easiest sources of character inspiration. Have you heard of League of Legends? Yeah, but I have only... I haven't played the game, and I yeah, only that's fair, really that's fair. saw the TV series. Uh, Arcane's really good. Uh... The thing is, a lot of personality goes into the character's voice lines, and a lot of, like, there's one character who's essentially, oh yeah, she, she uh, her parents were alchemists, and they gave out their cures for, for free to help heal the needy in their broken down town, and she resented them for it, because they never had anything. So when they died, due to gang violence, she took over, and again, CEO mindset, and... You know, the diff the kind of mindset where it's like, the only difference between poison and medicine is the dosage. Allow me to test. I love field testing products, or you'll work with me one way or the other, the easy way or the hard way. It like, just listening to her voice lines, just listening to a character's voice lines and getting in the mindset can give you so much inspiration for how to play your own characters. And most of the characters made by League, but you could probably find anything else. Anything with a lot of voice lines where they have to communicate it. Like maybe even fighting games, if you look at the visuals too. I think there's a lot of fun design language in that. I wrote a whole article where I referenced like fighting games as a great source of inspiration because every character has to show who they are through their actions. Because there's no time for like big lore exposition, blah, blah, blah. But yeah, okay. just voice lines, designs, just looking at those elements and finding ways to incorporate them. It's really fun and it can help you along to just make characters, improve upon characters and all that. Big recommendation. Voice line clips on YouTube and compilations. I have not listened to them for that reason. I've basically I've had a concept and then I mm -hmm. seek out how it's supposed to sound. Not listening to it in order to inform the character concept but that's a good twist on that that could be very inspiring if you're looking for something to embody during a game i have um in the Alice of alcon star they're about to go on to an airship and the airship has its own crew and i don't have personalities for any of the crew yet so maybe i should do that and that would help mm -hmm. me role play them make them come alive Actually, I think one of my articles goes into that specifically. It's like, it talks about, think of your character barks. What would they say in the middle of a fight? Or what you, what would you describe? Like, let's say your character just took down an enemy. You could say, her hand trembles and she whispers, I'm sorry, before moving on. Or she looks down at the enemy, sizing up their gear, but then she thinks better of it, for now. Or... Her head snaps to the next enemy. There's a smile on her face and hunger in her eyes. Like, those three things, just a little line, throw in, bam, three different characters. I, one of my articles goes into that and even links some of the videos that I, some of my favorite videos for character lines. So you've been going down some of them. I'm sure you'll bump into it eventually. Of course, as always, Eldritch Excursion. Every other Tuesday on the No Direction podcast website is where you can find me and my madman, madman ramblings and my uh, unrequited rivalry with Oros, the god of mutation and evolution. And uh, yeah, feel free to check out my work as it comes out this next Tuesday. Assuming nothing goes wrong, I'll have another article up for you to drag your eyeballs over. He has a surprising amount of useful stuff on there. And I don't just mean because it's balanced and it functions well. I mean, they're mechanics and topics that people actually care about. So go look at them. They're cool. Yeah, you might have to glance through a few of them before you find just the one you want. But I'm going to go there tonight. Oh, cool. yeah.
And I did hint at a playable ancestry for playing a sentient gear. So if you've ever had the dream of being a waistcoat or a broadsword or a magic wand, well... Dude, I'm going to use that for my uh, Hello as a Falcon Star for a magical item they found. Oh, nice. Yes. Oh, it can be... If anything, if a player character dies, maybe they find some treasure and, hey, that sword talks to them. Yeah, give it a look. Mechanic for starting your own home base, playing a sentient gear, being the starship, or a ton of lore that I made up for uh, Medusas in space. Many of them become VTubers. And the mechanics are useful as well for the Medusas, for playable Medusa characters. Absolutely. You too can become a Medusa VTuber. Who wouldn't want snakes grown out of their head? I'd love that. Mm-hmm. They need to make that like an actual elective surgery you can get. Like plastic surgery, nah, I'll have scale surgery, thanks. I mean, that wouldn't be the weirdest thing you can get in actual Starfinder. So really, you just kind of write the rules of it. No, I just kind of sold myself on another article idea, didn't I? I meant in real life, but okay. <laughs> huh. No, I kind of like the, the mini fro going on. I'm going to keep that for now, but, you know. Maybe get a couple snakes, like like snake bangs. That'd be snake, fun. No, that could work. I've seen a Medusa's snake hair styled that way online. I think there was only one picture, but it was cool looking. Oh, nice, nice. Anyway, a... thank you for joining us. We'll get back to you next time. We will. I will put on the um, in the Discord server, and I'll make a blog post stating when the next Nate Wright collab video is going to happen and the topic. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Have a good one.